Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. In J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, the second book is called The Two Towers. And while the two towers are not specifically mentioned in the book, as originally it was not a trilogy, there are many candidates as to the titular towers, including the Towers of Good Forces, Sirith Ungal and Minas Tirith, and the Towers of Evil Forces, Saruman's Orthanc or Sauron's Barad-dûr. I can't speak Middle Earth either, but I will let the viewers decide which of the towers are analogous to those mentioned in this video, where we will look at two extreme Earth towers. One is called Trump Tower, and the other is called Trump Tower, which makes it easy. One is in New York, and the other is in Chicago. Actually, the full name in Chicago is the Trump International Hotel and Tower, but I will refer to it as Trump Chicago. It is both a hotel and condo. This 98-story skyscraper was designed by Adrian Smith when he was with Skidmore, Owings & Merrill and opened in 2009. It appears that the International Real Estate Development and Construction Company, originally based in Australia, Bovis Land Lease, now Land Lease, developed and built the building and only licensed Donald Trump for his name. This arrangement brings in easy, risk-free money to Trump's company as he does not have to manage or finance the design and construction process. All he has to do is maintain the value of his brand, you know, by avoiding controversy. Trump Chicago sits right on the Chicago River, where the newspaper, the Chicago Sun-Times, once stood. As they say in real estate, location, location, location. It is near the three things that make Chicago, Chicago. Lake Michigan, the Chicago River, and the Loop. That area formed by the Loop Elevated Train, the L, in the downtown which contains the heart and soul of the city. It is the second tallest building in Chicago behind the former Sears Tower, now Willis Tower. And like most Adrian Smith buildings, it is competently boring. If it were not one of the tallest buildings in the world, or had Trump's name on it, most people would simply ignore it. Much is made of the building's river walk, but it is just that, a walk. It is not nearly as exciting an interaction between building and river as done on the iconic marina towers just downstream, where residents can park their cars and their boats in the same building where they live. But perhaps the yachts of the Trump Chicago residents would just be too big for the berths. The sign on the building became a controversy because Donald Trump. And this was before 2015. After getting approval from the two prior mayors of Chicago, Cruz began to erect the five-letter, 20-foot-tall sign that said, surprisingly, Trump. Chicago being Chicago, apparently the city council and the local aldermen needed to approve such signs because some money needs to be distributed among all the politicians. Many apparently forgot that the Sun-Times building demolished in 2004 had a sign about seven feet tall and 15 letters taken up around the same area. Adrian Smith, the architect, disavowed Trump's sign. The local architecture critic for the Chicago Tribune warned it would get an unfavorable review, and the city council went about passing laws specifically to stop this one sign, because we know a sign that says Trump is Chicago's biggest problem. Donald Trump came to media attention when he expanded his father's Queens-based real estate development company into Manhattan with the 1980 redevelopment of the old Commodore Hotel at Grand Central Terminal, Architecture Codex video number 21, into the Hyatt Hotel, something that people said could not be done. Trump pushed through the bureaucracy and did it. He then moved back to another ongoing project, the Trump Tower in New York City, but I will refer to it as Trump Tower. Planning for the building began in the mid-1970s, when New York City was still a battleground of crime and drugs, Midtown perhaps being an oasis. In 1979, Donald Trump bought the rights to the Bonwit Teller site, 
which, like Grand Central Terminal, was designed by Warren and Wetmore, and he worked to rezone the lot, obtain the air rights over the adjacent Tiffany building, and more legal wranglings to get permission he needed. Being a mixed-use tower only complicated the conflicting and complex New York City regulations which thwart design and construction. Trump steamrolled his way through all the criticism and complaints. He was pilloried in the press as a pushy kid no one took seriously and a huckster. You see, Donald Trump is from Queens, and the people in Manhattan have always looked down upon the people from the outer boroughs. And yet I know the guys from the outer boroughs can be tougher and really be your best buds as long as you don't mess with them. If you don't understand that about Donald Trump, you will never get him. At this point, Trump was developer and co-financier, but it appears it was also the classic other people's money. Trump would parlay his name as the banner of success to attract additional investors and then run the project, design, construction, and marketing. But he was also taking more personal financial risk at this time. The building broke ground in 1981 and Trump Tower opened in 1983. The tower was designed by architect Der Scott, recently of swanky Hayden Connell, and was a reasonable, if not outstanding, skyscraper. It is 58 stories tall, but it was one of the first skyscrapers to renumber the floors, so the top floor is labeled the 68th floor. Are you really surprised? The distinguishing form was the laterally step-back lines of windows on the southwest corner at 5th Avenue and 56th Street, which cleverly increases the views from the building and natural light penetrating into the building. My favorite parts were the many POPs, P-O-Ps, privately owned public spaces, the outdoor terraces on the bottom floors, which are sometimes hard to find. I like places to sit outside in midtown Manhattan. Most New Yorkers don't care. From here you could get a good view of the AT&T building, which I like better. The tower had an atrium shopping center at its base, offices, and apartments. Still, there is nothing wrong with the tower just got designed. But overshadowing the design of the tower were the finishing touches, which were more direct Trump flourishes, and enhanced the pomposity of the building, even though it has nothing to do with the architect. For example, when it first opened, the doorman had these massive red coats, like they were British Beefeater guards. That has since been toned down. The interior was designed with a lot of Ivana Trump's input as she was the vice president of interior design for the Trump organization. It was a pink marble nightmare, accented with bright breasts passing as gold. But this overstated, old world, gaudy interior, reminiscent of Austria-Hungarian Rococo, was what built the Trump brand. Apparently, rich people around the world like this garbage. So whether the Trumps believed this actually looked good or knew their clients would think it looked good is irrelevant. It remains tacky and silly. In a style I refer to as nouveau kish for the nouveau riche. Another example of design foolishness is the entryway that had pink marble on the floors and the walls and sloped down from the street level to the shopping atrium. But when it rained or snowed in New York, the floor would become so slippery people would slide and fall. The solution was to install those large temporary black rubber mats, which means because of New York weather, they were there all the time. A good designer would know how to design the entrance so the ugly mats would not be needed there and people would still not slip. Perhaps you should avoid putting smooth marble on the floor. It is said that towers are a subtle expression of male genitalia, a form of bragging. It is also said that the female counterpart in architecture is the atrium, that void inside of a building. Well, at Trump Tower, the atrium is also in pink marble. So imagine then entering the Trump Tower through a slit of an opening through a pink tunnel and into an open pink shaft moist because of the water flowing down one wall. Afterwards, you may feel the need to have a cigarette, but please take it outside to one of the pop terraces. The Trumps had both a penthouse apartment and offices in the Trump Tower, and the residences were audaciously designed by Angelo Donia, 
It delved into Rococo, the one architectural style I do not like, with heavy gold gilding and opulent flourishes, as if this was the home of Louis XIV, who was once called the vainest man ever. And while that may be an appropriate design choice for the client, rumors of a gold toilet in this apartment appear to have been fake news. On the other hand, at the Trump Chicago, decades later, there were still many complaints regarding the use of zebra wood in the lobby. But I think it is perfectly fine, and it just shows you that some people are always looking for a way to be negative. It is obvious that Donald Trump's personal audacity has always been fodder for the press. He provokes this by always speaking in superlatives and absolutes. This is the greatest hotel ever. Stuff like that, which is completely unprovable. But he knew that would provoke the media and give him free publicity and keep his brand, his name, in front of the people. He put out books, bought beauty contests and sports teams, sought controversy and its associated publicity. All this attracted the circles of power and money who like his boldness, his ability to get things done. Trump was an active Democrat liberal in New York City whose money got him access to a lot of essential political favors that were happily sold by the Democrats who controlled the city. Consequently, many people liked to jump on his ascending fame, including people like Al Sharpton. Trump gave Sharpton's organization money, Sharpton gave him access to Don King, and spoke highly of the Trump's outreach to the black community. It was probably all superficial back then, but it worked for everyone's benefit. There is so much written and said about Donald Trump, I don't feel the need to repeat it here, and you probably have read and heard all you care to. In summary though, Trump's business model changed significantly in the 1990s after a few of his businesses went bankrupt. But if you do your research, you will see that often Donald Trump sold all his interests in the business long before the business with his name on it went bankrupt. Bankruptcy happened to nearly all the casinos in Atlantic City when more gambling options opened up on unregulated Amerindian lands. And real estate in general was hit hard in the 1990s because of the quick expansion and risky speculative underwriting nationwide that started back in the 1980s. Trump was not immune to that. They say if you owe the bank a little money, the bank owns you. But if you owe the bank a lot of money, you own the bank. Trump owned the bank. With that kind of leverage and expensive legal advice, the Trump Organization was able to refinance and make a comeback. After the collapse, Trump found that licensing his name was less risky and more lucrative, and his brand was even enhanced by his comeback from near ruin. So you began to see the name Trump appear on all sorts of things businesses, luxury brand goods, and even buildings owned and not owned by Donald Trump. If you love him, you would say this was brilliant. If you hate him, you would call it hucksterism. So you see, nothing has really changed. Donald Trump is who you want him to be. As for business practices such as redlining, profiteering, or not paying the last invoice, or countersuing when you're being sued, that's all part of the really nasty game of real estate development in New York City. Singling out Trump's organization as particularly dishonest or mean is disingenuous. All the development firms hire more lawyers than they do architects, and it is not unusual for politicians to strong arm developers for money and favors, such as give to my campaign and give my nephew a job or I will investigate you, or stop that zoning variance that you need. Add to that dealing with unions, waste container companies and concrete firms both run by mafia hoodlums, the Department of Buildings, and all the vested interests that move around the city, you can see how one might become tough and callous. For the Trumps then, not much has changed in the 80 years since Fred Trump started the family business. And personally, as noted, since all the development firms will stiff their architects for their last invoice, I would believe that most architects are smart enough to build that into their fee schedules. But I, for one, avoid working for developers primarily for those reasons. If people are interested in being fair, and I see less and less of that these days, you have to acknowledge that the Trump Organization has been very successful 
developing properties of very good quality for the upper echelon across the world, some of which still bear the name Trump and others which have had the name removed, at least for now. The methods of doing that kind of development are not always pretty, and one can easily make as many enemies as you do friends. And the Trump name will attract attention even if you are a nobody making videos on YouTube. Notice how much of this video focuses on Donald Trump and not the architect, what, what's his name? I have known some people who moved through the circles surrounding President Trump, and they were very impressed with his genuine concern for the working person, going out of his way to thank them directly and publicly, and sometimes showing extreme generosity. On the other hand, the Trumps are very good at aggravating bad press. An electrician friend of mine was working on a Trump building, and it was the end of the day, and he and the other technicians were beginning to pack up, ready to go home. A Trump family member came by and begged them to stay later so that they can finish the job. They said they were tired and hungry and didn't want to miss dinner. So she offered to get them dinner if they would stay. They agreed. She got them dinner and then charged them for it. It's a classic mistake I've seen many owners make, getting petty about something really small. So instead of being a hero for about $100 worth of food, you become the focus of humorous contempt stories for the rest of their life. And you don't want someone who is doing your plumbing to be angry with you. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.